I'm uh, excited to announce our last speaker for the day. Uh, and then Who we is have. It? Oh, I, well, hold on. Just give me a minute. Um, <laughs> uh, he is an assistant professor in the information science department at Cornell. His research is on developing machine learning models and algorithms focusing on applications in humanities and social science. He is also the chief architect for the Mallet Toolkit, which is an incredible resource um, if, you've, uh, if you're at all interested in machine learning. So please help me welcome David Nimno. Okay, thank, thank you ever for coming. This is a, this is a really exciting uh, place to be, and, and, and uh, I'm so glad. I'm, I'm sorry I'm the last thing that's between you and dinner and dinosaurs, uh, <laughs> which is a difficult place to be. Um, so what I want to talk to you about is my experience trying to teach machine learning with data visualization, and, and D3 and JavaScript in, in particular. And so I want to start by, by saying, what is machine learning? Um, so th this is my core area of research. I, I, like many people, I, I want to say I'm, I'm a terrible data visualization person, um, and I, I'm, I'm starting to be not a terrible teacher, I hope. Um, but, but so machine learning is, is my core area, and, and I like to think of it as, as this, this three-step process where you start with data. We try to learn a model from data that summarizes some pattern in that, in that, in that uh, information that can then be used to give us some kind of insight about the data. Now, often this is something like uh, trying to make a prediction, like is this transaction fraudulent? Or will this user click on this link? But it can also be used for exploratory purposes. So for example, in, in the, the recent trend towards data journalism, um, was something that people are really interested in is say taking 10,000 documents that have been dumped um, on your desk by someone who hates you with no index and, and, and no organization and, and try to find out what's interesting. Where should we spend our time looking at this, this document collection? That, that's actually um, something I try to do with my research in topic modeling, which I'm not going to discuss today. It's kind of relieving. Um, and so three things have, have really um, made machine learning a, an enormously powerful tool in the last 10 to 20 years. The first is a lot more computation. So things that used to be mathematical curiosities are now being done at large scale um, by major corporations. The second is access to a lot more data. So there's things that don't work if you don't have enough data. But if you have enough information, then you can get some signal there. And the last is that, that we've uh, moved away from uh, symbolic representations of, of knowledge towards uh, statistical inference tools. And this is, has proven, with the combination of data, computation, and, and stats, to be an incredibly powerful uh, combination. Um, and, and one of the things that the, the, uh, the, the grad students that, that, I, uh, that I practiced this talk on mentioned was that um, you may not realize this, but your life is in very serious ways shaped by algorithms and models. Maybe if you're totally off the grid, you, you, this might not be true, but if, if you have a phone, if you use a computer, you, your experience, um, you know, what, what, what ads you're shown, what, what news articles you're offered, um, eHarmony, is using algorithms, so, so our most, most intimate moments are controlled by algorithms to a large extent. So I think that everyone needs to know about machine learning. In particular, I, I'm really interested in, in trying to, to, to produce tools that will be useful for people studying history and literature. Okay, so, so here's the problem. So to go back about a minute, and, and remember I said statistical inference. So what I'm saying is that there's this incredibly powerful tool that I think everyone needs to know about which involves learning statistics, a, 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 an area that most people, re, re, they respond to with some variation between mild discomfort and what I recently heard described as Lovecraftian horror. <laughs> so I, I think that this is, this is an important time to think about how we teach statistical inference and machine learning. And I'm going to make a case that um, combining visualization with mathematics, with code, those three things, 
is, is a very powerful tool for, for conveying insight and intuition about, about math. Okay. So this is kind of the traditional approach that we have towards, towards teaching machine learning. It's, it's um, very notation heavy. This is a, this is a very concise and, and, um, and powerful language for describing mathematical relationships, but it is a language. And if you don't speak that language, then this means nothing to you. In fact, for a lot of the people I work with, it would be better if this was ancient Greek. <laughs> they would be more likely to understand it. So, so by itself, mathematic, mathematical notation and, and sort of the traditional sand at the board um, writing equations way of teaching is, is, is not, or, or, or communicating about math is, is not necessarily the best thing. So what, what if we go step back from the mathematics and talk more about, about code, so actually implement things and, and, and see how they, they, they work. Um, and I think that's also a very valuable tool, but, but in isolation it can also be extremely confusing. Um, does anyone have any idea what this code does? <laughs> yes. It, so so um, that's, that, that's a good guess from the, 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 the base distribution. Statistical inference, yes. So, so, so this is probably the most obfuscated code I've ever written. I can say that because I wrote it. Um, so this, this, is, this is very confusing. Um, and it's not at all clear uh, what this is doing or how it relates. And, and the problem with looking at code for, for machine learning models is that it's often written with an eye towards speed and efficiency and, and conciseness and not with an eye towards clarity and readability. All right, so the third leg, visualization. And it, it, this is a, a, a wonderful tool that I found um, that, that is bringing together a lot of visualizations of machine learning models. But I would suggest that, that it also is not sufficient in and of itself. So um, what this is showing you is, is, is very complicated visualizations of, of powerful algorithms shown from, from multiple different angles. And, and, and they're beautiful. And if you're mathematically prepared, I think they can give you some good insight. But by themselves, I, I, I don't think for the, the, the base level audience, especially for undergraduates, that, that this is going to be effective. So I propose, and, and I'm sort of actively testing this hypothesis, um, that the best way to convey intuition about machine learning is to create little bite-sized nuggets that combine visualization, code that, act, that, that people can actually write themselves within a short amount of time, and mathematics that, that makes precise the relationships that are reflected in, in the visualization, that, that that is, I'm not going to say the most, but, but a effective way of, of communicating these ideas. And I want to show you four examples of some different concepts that, um, that I've actually been using in, in a, um, an experiment um, that I've been running at, at Cornell. Uh, they, they've kindly given me 120 undergrad um, participants in this study. They think they're taking a course. Um, I'm sure they'll see this video and, and then they'll complain um, that they're, they're all doing great. Um, and so the first example I want to show you is um, well, so one of the earlier talks talked about um, sentiment classification. So let's say you get a document and you want to know is it a positive, say, Yelp review or a negative Yelp review? The goal is, is to take that input and, and, and make a decision. A model for doing this is to take every distinct word and give it a numerical weight, either positive or negative. And then you make a decision by adding up the weights for each word in the document. And if that sum is positive, you say it's a positive review. And if it's negative, you say it's a negative review. And one way to visualize this model is like this. So I'm putting every word on an x-axis and a y-axis. The, the y-axis just represents their frequency. So and is very frequent. 
Weighted is not very frequent. The left to right represents the, the, the ratio of these words in positive or, or five-star Yelp reviews and, and one-star Yelp reviews. So the words horrible, rude, and worst are about 20 times more likely in negative reviews than in positive reviews. And the, the, the actual X position, left or, or right of, of the, the middle line, is exactly that weight that we put on each word. So we, I could take a document like uh, I waited some number of minutes, but it's always great. And I could add up the X positions of those four words, and I would get a decision, whether that's a positive or a negative review. It would probably come out somewhere in the middle, which you can see because they're about the same distance right or left. So that, that's the predictive mode. The, you can also use this for um, sort of to, to learn something about the phenomenon of Yelp reviews. So one thing I noticed is, first of all, there, there's, there's a lot more words that are significantly positive than words that are significantly negative. Hey, there's some negative space. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so fresh, favorite, delicious, amazing, friendly, love. Um, and they tend to be kind of adjectives that are about food. But the negative words, manager, told, minutes, didn't, she, no, would, um, and also rude, worst, horrible, waited. These are mostly about service. And they, actually, there, there was some recent work uh, by Danny Rasky at, at Stanford uh, that, that was on, made the radio, um, describing how, how different Yelp reviews sort of, sort of have different ca characteristics. Um, so I mean, this is useful information for, for managers to know that, that service is what, what really drives bad reviews, but it, it, it's generally useful. So here's the code that implements this. So it's D3. I'm taking my words. I'm setting their x attribute to the result of a function. Let's look at it from the inside out. So I'm taking the number of times this word occurs in five-star documents divided by the total number of tokens in five-star reviews, dividing that by the number of times it occurs in one-star documents divided by the proportion in one star tokens. So taking that ratio of, of probabilities, taking the log of that, changing that to log base 10, and then scaling it. So that's all there is. So this is using a very complicated algorithm called counting. <laughs> so I counted up the words, divided them by the total number of words, and, and, and gave ratios. So, so this is a very simple algorithm. So the next thing I want to talk about is, is a more complicated algorithm. And what I want to do is, is, is cluster these points. So I want to say that there are groups of points, and, um, and, and there's sort of regions of density. Now, we, we can see this. We can see that there's, there's sort of a, a cluster over here, and a cluster over here, and something over here. And it, 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 do people, is this easy or hard? Easy. It, it seems pretty easy. So, so that's an illusion. <laughs> it's an illusion because we have this incredibly powerful machinery for, for identifying clusters in, in two-dimensional space. Um, it turns out this, the, 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 the goal of, of putting, uh, uh, creating clusters of, of points that have this sort of lowest distance from each other and the furthest distance from, from points in other clusters is, is um, it's intractable. So I'm not going to throw technical terms at you, but it, it's basically as hard as any problem that, that you're likely to solve. There, there's no way to find the best solution to this problem without basically checking every possible uh, partition of, of the points. But it turns out that there's a, there's a class of algorithms that can get us a pretty good solution that, that's quite simple. And that, that's this iterative pattern. So why don't I just throw down some random cluster centers, so those red numbers. 
They really have no relation. I, I just sampled them from a uniform distribution. And I'm going to set all the points to have a number that, that reflects their closest center. Again, this is not a very good clustering. I just made it up a minute ago. And now I'm going to move the cluster centers so that they're in the centroid of, of the points that are assigned to them. Okay, so they moved. And now I'm going to recluster the points, and, and the ones that change are going to sort of grow and then shrink. I don't know if anyone can see any of this on the screen, yeah. but okay. So then I'm going to keep doing that. Okay, there's only a few of them that are kind of moving now. Okay, and now it's converged. So this is this iterative pattern where you start with a terrible solution and, and slowly make it better, usually by alternating between maximizing two different objectives. And that turns out to be incredibly powerful and, and a large class of machine learning algorithms are just a slight tweak on that. So there you go. Yeah. I, I, I promised the organizer I wouldn't try to teach anyone here much machine learning, but, but I, if, it, if it happens, it's an accident. Okay, so th this turns out to be a, a really lucky case because in, in, in some cases, if you start, um, uh, so, sometimes there, there's, a, there's a, a center that's sort of in this, this not very dense region right here. So, so it's not guaranteed to come to any particular solution. And, and the, the, the numbers of the clusters are, are random. It, it, if I change the numbers, it, it would be exactly the same. So the, the, these are important things to know about this algorithm, that there, there's no guarantee you'll get to an op, a global optimum. And, and it's invariant to, to label permutation. Okay. Let's look at the code. So as I said, there, there are two things that we have to do. So we have to, we have to cluster the, the points. So we have to find their closest centroid. I'm going to do something for each point. I'm going to set a variable that's, that's recording the, the shortest distance to a cluster. Set it to positive infinity first. And then for each cluster, I'm going to calculate the distance. This is our friend Pythagoras. Or something that's the square of the distance. And if that distance is the shortest we've seen so far, I'll set it to that cluster. So this is something that undergrads can, can write themselves within a 50-minute class if you explain to them how to do it. Here's how we change the location of the clusters. I'm going to do something for each cluster. I'm going to grab the points using a filter that are assigned to that cluster. And I'm going to set the x value for the cluster to the mean of the x values of those points. So this is why this is called the k-means algorithm, because you have k clusters and you set them to the mean. And I'd like to, to suggest that, that an essential part of understanding this algorithm was seeing it move. Is that, is that fair? And having access to the code that allows you to understand why they move to where they move. Here's another example. It's going to be a perceptron classifier. Got a bunch of points. Can people see that there's blue points and there's red points? OK. So I, I, want to, I want to separate these, these blue points and red points. The, the goal would be to do this in high dimensional space so I could, I could um, train a classifier for fraud detection or, or, or something like that. And what I want to do for this example is give you an example of what's called an online algorithm. So in the, in the previous example, it, it was an iterative algorithm, but I alternated between moving all of the means, so the model, and reclustering all of the points. So I did the entire data set all at once. If, if my data set is gigantic, then I have to wait until I get through all of it before I can change anything. So in practice, a lot of commercial machine learning is done in an online fashion where we're taking little bits of data at a time. And this is, this is how this, this perceptron algorithm works. So let me just draw an arbitrary line. OK, 
Okay. Is that clear at all? Okay. So it's kind of going like that. Um, I'm setting the background color actually with, with a, a, a line that's perpendicular to that, that, that has a, a stroke width of 2,000. Um, if anyone can think of a cleaner way to do this, I'd be, I'd be interested, but, but it does seem to work. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is yeah, I'm, I'm going to hit the sample and update button, and it's going to grab a random point. And if it's on the right side of the line, so it's not got a little black outline around it, it's going to ignore it. And if it's on the wrong side, so if, if it's got that, that black outline, it's going to try to move the line, the, 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 the decision boundary line, so that it's perpendicular to that point. OK, so the first one uh, was correctly classified, so we're going to ignore it. Second one, too. Oh, we're getting lucky. OK. <coughs> All right, there's one. All right, did you see that move? OK, I'm just going to sort of click things. And it'll become increasingly unlikely that, oh, there was two, that we're going to get a misclassified point. Oh, there's one. OK, so at this point, we, we have probably about the best classifier that we're going to get for this data set. And, and so what I want to show with this is it's both this pattern of, of, of taking small bits of data at a time. Imagine this is a stream of, of data coming in, where you're not even keeping anything that you've seen before. And you're just, you're just updating the classifier that, that you currently have. Um, the other important thing is, is, could I have created a line that would separate these points cleanly? It's a little hard to see with the colors, but, but no, there, there's actually, you can show that there is no single line that, that would have separated them. So the, the, this, this also introduces the, you know, the, the students picked up on this immediately, that, that this objective is not necessarily satisfiable. Let's look at the code. I'm not going to talk too much about this because it requires a little bit of linear algebra. But this is really just adding and multiplying. So the, the first part is where we're going to make a prediction for the point. I'm going to take the inner product of, of a, a vector that defines that, that classifier line. And, and if that inner product is positive, it's on the, wrong, uh, the right side, or on, on the positive side. If it's, on, if it's negative, it's on the negative side. So we, we multiply that by the label, which is either positive 1 or negative 1. And if that's less than 0, so if it's gotten it wrong, then we change the classifier vector so that it's either pointing towards or away from the point that we misclassified. So again, not very hard. But that's, that's the core of this algorithm. Our last example, this is, this is a linear regression. People familiar with linear regression? OK, this is one of the models that people are most familiar with. Um, the data is actually also from Yelp. It, the, uh, the x axis is showing the, the log of the, the um, or on a log scale, the number of reviews that a business got. And the, the y axis is showing you the average rating, the average star rating for that business. And you can see that if I fit the best fit straight line, it's sort of going up. There seem, seems to be a positive relationship. Um, but it's maybe not a great fit. There seems to be a lot of variability for a small number of reviews. And maybe the best thing to say is that if you have a lot of ratings, you're probably not a bad business, which seems reasonable. Now, mathematically, what this model is saying is that if you increase the number of reviews in expectation, you will increase your star rating. So it's saying that the, the linear regression model says that there is a linear relationship between two variables, an input and an output. And let's say we want to test that assumption and, and find out, is this actually a, a robust relationship, or is this just an artifact of, a, of outliers or a, small data, or a small sample size? And we often do this with something like a, a t-test or, or, or an asymptotic test. But the, 
I think that there's a much simpler way to show this. And this actually goes back 100 years to, to early work in, in statistics that at the time was, was thought to be a, a curiosity because it was too computational. So what we're going to do is, is we want to see what would happen if there was no relationship between the input and the output, the x-axis and the y-axis, and get a sense for what, what that would look like. And I'm going to do that by shuffling the y values, plotting the linear regression line for that shuffled data, and then moving it back. So let me do that a few more times. And you can see from the, the transformation, or the, the, uh, the transition, that I'm keeping all the, the, the x values for the points the same. I'm just changing their y values so that they only go up and down. They don't go side to side. And I'm building up a sense, an empirical distribution, of what, what that line would look like if there, was, if there was no relationship between number of reviews and star rating. And what I'm noticing is that my actual value, my actual <coughs> thicker, blacker line, is, has a higher slope than any of those random permutations. And that suggests to me that, that this is a fairly strong result, that it's unlikely that I would have gotten this result just by random chance. But I like, I like to, sh to show this visualization because it, it, it shows that this idea that, that we're randomly permuting one of the variables and then saying, what would that, what would that model look like? And building an idea of, of the distribution of models, not by appealing to asymptotics or, or p-values, which people don't understand all that well, usually, when they come in, um, with this empirical view. So let's look at the code. Um, I've taken out some of it. But the basic idea is that I have a randomized data set. <coughs> I'm going to shuffle the, the indices of this data set and create points by taking the real x value and the shuffled y value. So the x values are the same, but the y values are randomly shuffled. So there's the same number of them. The, the same, they have the same mean. You actually saw that the, that the lines all went through a single point. That's because the, the mean of the x's and the mean of the y's is the same. I'm going to move the circles, create a new linear model from my randomized data, draw a line for that, and then move the circles back. That's all it is. So as I said, I, I, I've been teaching a class I, I, long enough in the semester that I actually was able to get some feedback from the students. Um, I, I want to tell you a bit about them first. Um, their, their reported programming skill is pretty good. So they, they've taken a, a programming class. Um, they, they know how to write code in, in Python or, or some JavaScript. They've been exposed to statistics, but a lot fewer of them feel that they have a strong background in it. And I, I, so I think that what I'm going to argue is that these are a fairly representative set of, of people who code, maybe took a stats class in, in college, know something about linear regression, maybe, but, but, but don't have a very solid feel. And when I ask them uh, anonymously, visualizations help me understand algorithms and mathematical models. Um, again, this is preliminary data, but, but they do seem to feel that, that this was helpful. So this is encouraging. Okay. So I want to end by talking a bit about what are the limits of this type of method. So I, I, I've told you that, that I want to, to take little bite-sized chunks of machine learning, make th take things that, that have clear visual explanations, but also have, have fairly easy um, or, or concise code attached to them that, that, that presents the mathematical relationships in, in actual code. So what, is, what does that leave us? 
How, how restrictive is that? Um, and I want to suggest that it's, it's increasingly not restrictive. I, I think there, 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 are, there is a growing body of work that, that can be presented in this way. Um, this is an example that, that, uh, that I did for a, a little graduate workshop. Uh, this is uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, uh, which I, I'm sure you all did in high school, right? <laughs> okay. No. Th so this, this is something that took me about 45 minutes to explain to um, graduate level computer science students. Uh, it, it's, it's sampling from a Gaussian distribution, so, so these, these points should have sort of the same density as those, those, um, those ovals. But it's still clearly visualizable. The idea is that you have a little point that's, that's sort of bouncing around in a sort of physics-inspired way that, that either accepts or rejects uh, and draws a little point if it accepts. I'm not going to go any further into that. Uh, but, but this is an example, I think, of, of a non-trivial algorithm that, that I can do with this. Um, the other thing that's really important to remember is, is that um, JavaScript, I, I was kind of shocked to learn that this sort of the, the discovery that, that set me on this path, um, that, that because JavaScript is so important for the browser makers, JavaScript is, is really fast. Um, and uh, I think it, it will, the, the thing that is holding JavaScript back from being a serious scientific programming tool is really libraries, and that's something that we can fix. Um, and so getting back to the, the idea of teaching machine learning, I, I think that given that we have really good capabilities, so a lot of processing power, a lot of fast, um, fast computation in, in a platform that's installed on everyone's browser already. Um, given some thought and, and perhaps a, a sequence of examples that, that would build up local libraries and patterns and, 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 um, and templates, I think that, that we can go very far with this type of pattern. Um, and I'm really optimistic for, for using this style of, of teaching both in the classroom and in an in ongoing MOOC setting, for example, or, or, in, uh, or just putting out a lot of gists and letting people look at them. Um, so yeah, the, the, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic and, and I'd love to hear more about your response and, and I'll take any questions.